Very good morning to um, everybody. <laughs> Wonderful to see so many of you to come and spend your public holiday together with us on the, this retreat. So we also have a few kind of like instructions for the day today so that we all know what we're doing uh, because it helps to settle the mind if we have a little bit of an idea what's going to happen so we don't have to worry about um, these kind of things. So one of the most important things that we mentioned during our public talk uh, on Tuesday already is that we learn how to relax. And I give the word to Bandit Chunda for that one. <laughs> so it's quite important that when we come to a, um, a meditation or a short one-day retreat, because we do live a very busy schedule, work, family commitment, and um, KL is quite a busy um, city. Yeah? And um, when we came from Joe Barula to um, KL, we noticed, wow, the traffic is, as, as usual, is quite, is um, pretty, pretty bad. So we do rush a lot, and um, sometimes it is quite busy out there. So when we come to the monastery, or to a retreat center, or to a meditation class, it's always good just to really learn to relax, because it's not, it's, it's hard and life is hard enough, but right? sometimes it's not quite coming to a retreat center where you have to strive and really endure. Right? So in um, Bodhiana, or especially Jana Grove, the retreat center right? that's next to the monastery, yeah? we do have a retreat and um, chairs are very popular. Right? So sometimes when um, new Western person that comes to learn meditation for the first time, first time, eh, they find sitting on, on the floor is um, a bit too hard and too tough for them, especially if they're not born sitting on the floor. Eh. So one thing that um, we do encourage you, eh, if, um, if, if you can, please use a chair, especially if you have um, leg injury or you're not sitting on the floor for a long period of time. Eh. Because in, in the retreat center, eh, for some that have been been the mob to our uh, Jana Gopi Center, uh, the chairs in the back and the sides is taken very fast. Uh, so please use the chairs because when you come to the monastery uh, and practice meditation, uh, the most important thing is to relax this body as much as possible. It's, we don't encourage to see full pain. A little bit of pain is, 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 good, is good to endure, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we have to really relax this body. Because when we relax this body, uh, then you find it's easier to stay with the breath. If the, if the body is quite uncomfortable and we move around, uh, then it can be a di big distraction uh, to calming the mind down. Uh. So we really encourage uh, to, to use the chair. And if there's not enough chairs, uh, we can always bring out more chairs. Uh, thank you. Yes, and actually as I was putting the chairs out yesterday, uh, or maybe the day before, whenever it was, we have those grey mats on the floor as well. So there were um, too many of them and they were kind of in the way. So I just put it on the bench at the, at the back there. And then once I wanted to put it away, I went like, hang on a minute. Why don't we use it as some padding at the back there? And that's actually quite nice. I feel um, it has just the right height for me to sit normally, just like on a chair. But it has one advantage as well that a chair has. You can actually lean against the wall a little bit or you can get a cushion out. That's why I put some of the cushions on the chairs. So please make sure um, you find a comfortable position. Um, very often I find, um, you know, it's not those sofas we need or those chairs where you really kind of sink into them, but a little bit of support of your lower back can actually be great. And that's what I usually do. Um, you know, when we teach in Australia, the monks, they have like uh, a little step where we sit on the mat and so you can put your cushion just behind and you have just enough support from the back, uh, which is great. All right, uh, please. Also, one more thing to add. Uh, so regardless if you're sitting on the floor or on the chair, uh, the result is basically almost the same. Because mm -hmm. from the feedback, we have some retreatants in Perth and other places. It seems like people are getting into quite deep, nice meditation. Uh, 
regardless sitting on the chair la, or sitting on the floor. La. Sometimes it's just a lot easier la, as we get older or we have injury la, to just sit on the chair. La. Thank you. Great. So, having mentioned that, um, probably most of you are familiar with Ajahn Brahm and are also familiar with the term he coined, which is kindfulness. And it's very important. We hear about mindfulness so much. And very often when we hear about mindfulness, we really think it's something we have to, again, strive, strive for, or we have to use a lot of force and we forget the aspect of kindness. So um, hopefully today we can practice with kindfulness because that's all we really need. Kindfulness towards our body when we're practicing, kindfulness towards our mind, towards the mental states, kindfulness towards our breathing when it arises, and then also kindfulness to all the other participants that are sharing this space here with us. So if we can live in peace and harmony together today, then we will support each other's practice. And that is very important when there is a, a bigger group that we don't create unnecessary friction because that will help the mind to become calm and peaceful um, much, much more easily. So a few points that uh, could help Mindfulness is key, so please remember um, that term throughout the day. And for the people who have come to Australia, they will know we have lots of teddy bears <laughs> around at, at, uh, at Jana Grove. Uh, the whole stage is actually full of them. We have like piles and piles. And then sometimes they bring snails and all sorts of fluffy uh, animals. Um, but even if that is just a reminder to be soft and to be kind, it's great. So the Buddha statue is like a reminder for us for all those beautiful qualities and the teddy bear is kind of the reminder for us in our tradition if we want to call it that to be kind to be soft and we do have a schedule and we put that up so you will find it on the on the door and outside and as schedules go we try to keep to it but you know there's always a few little things i've already found two mistakes <laughs> but instead of running around yesterday and you know crossing it off on each paper or taking it down and printing it again um, we just leave it as it is and we we you know we accept that things don't always are perfect or never actually are perfect but um we will usually give some instructions for about half an hour and then we'll guide a meditation which is for about, you know, 40, 45 minutes, whatever. But you will see on the schedule, it says sitting meditation, walking meditation, break. So these times are meant for you to sit and meditate. If you feel like sitting and meditating, if you feel it's too much for some reason, it's great to do some walking meditation. So we have uh, a room next door here where we can put on the aircon. And um, uh, I had a look this morning. so. You have those elements here, there's five of them. So maybe five people can just walk in, in one direction back and forth. Uh, and then we have one floor down. There's a huge hole um, that we're, where we can also put the aircon on. So you can do some walking meditation there in those times where nothing formal or official is happening up here. So just that you know what that means. And then, um, yes, the schedule is optional. So if you are walking down there, and you're getting really peaceful or even if you are sitting somewhere in a, in a quiet corner and you're really peaceful what we are developing today is peacefulness and if you are developing that in your own mind then you don't need any more instructions you can always ask Bobby afterwards to get the slides and, and read it and um, so you don't have to come to these sessions if you don't want to that's just the way Ajahn Brahm encourages us to practice, to just listen to our body and our mind and do what is uh, the best and what leads to peace, calm and clarity. Uh, please jump in any time if all good. Right, and one other thing which um, helps us in our practice is noble silence. So I do really encourage you to keep noble silence today um, in the world, that's something which is so difficult to find. 
And if you actually are quiet in the world, very often people think you are weird, <laughs> or you're strange, or something is wrong, or you're giving them like the silent treatment, or whatever. But here, we actually know we give noble silence to each other as a gift. So you don't have to worry about this whatsoever. And it's perfectly fine to not say anything. If there is anything you wish to ask, of course, you can come up to the monks and ask us if there's some time in between. We have a box um, for the questions as well, where you can write them on a little piece of paper. And we'll have some question and answer sessions. And I'm sure if there is anything, you know, um, with the place here that needs to be um, addressed, uh, or just passed on, uh, and Bobby and Su Ling, I'm sure, have an open ear <laughs> to listen to you quickly and solve any problems that might arise. So that reduces our outer chatter, and that will help to calm down the inner chatter as well. So when we have a calm, peaceful environment, the calm and peace can grow within. Now that also includes the chatter online. We are so connected these days with all our devices and our phones. So I really, really encourage you as well today, if it's not absolutely necessary and you are, you know, I don't know, running another country, <laughs> a very important person or something, <laughs> which is not the case, we know, we don't have such uh, VIPs here, um, then you can drop that and it will really be helpful. Because so often we just check and check and check and that disturbs the peace of the mind and then we find something and then it starts you know reverberating in our minds and in our hearts and it destroys the peace that we are trying to grow here okay i think we have one last one yes the q a session i have already mentioned that so ajahn brahm often refers to those beautiful signs that you can find all over the place and you have them here as well they don't say stop, but they say berenti. And that's what we do here today. But usually what happens when you see that sign, you are, you know, kind of in a rush and you want to get somewhere and, and you are not really happy to stop. So we have to learn to be happy to stop. And whenever you stop, you remember to relax to relax and to let go. And what do we let go of? Of course, we let go of the past and we let go of the future. So hopefully you can do that when you come to a stop sign. Hopefully you can do that when you come to traffic. But hopefully you can do that here today as well and practice it with us. So if we let go of the past, of all the worries and the concerns of whatever we might have done, but we we can't change it. And we let go of the anxiety, of the fear that is connected with what is coming in the future. So I gave you a little bit of an idea for the program today and you will be taken care of. So you don't have to think about today. And the future, leave it up until six o'clock when this retreat finishes. And when you do that, you will be able to get in touch with those beautiful in-between moments very often we get the question, you know, how can we practice in day-to-day -day life? Make the most of all the in-between moments. And now here, we have a very long in-between moment. <laughs> it's like you are stuck on a plane on a journey somewhere. So we are stuck here together until tonight. So we can appreciate all the different in-between moments um, that are readily available for us here. Just two more quotes from our teacher to encourage you for today. Number one, patience is the fastest way. So we always think we have to rush to be successful. We have to rush to get what we want. And patience, especially in meditation, is very, very important. Because if we rush, we rush over the foundations. We rush past the things which are important to develop the states that we are after um, later down the track. And then also, of course, <coughs> things will arise that don't work out as they should. And that's another beautiful quote from Ajahn Brown that I love. Real beauty does not lie in perfection, 
but in embracing and accepting imperfection. So life is imperfect, we are imperfect, um, everything is imperfect basically, even though they might be perfect to a big degree, there's always little things here and there. But if we can embrace them and if we can accept them, then everything becomes peaceful and calm and that's what we are practicing here. Okay, that's just a few um, introductory notes here. I'm seeing the time is already going fast. <laughs> but um, shall we go into the first session of the first ideal attitude? I really liked that word. Um, it was actually Venable Bhikkhu Bodhi who mentioned it when he was talking about the Metta Sutta. I was preparing for that to teach it over in uh, JB Johobaru. And he said it's the ideal attitudes, and that really kind of make, made sense to me. And I try to use words that we use in everyday life so we can understand um, the terms hopefully better. First one is love, second one is care, third one is joy, and the last one is peace. But let's go through them one by one. This morning's session is on love, on the word metta. So metta could be translated as kindness or as friendliness. Um, that's something I think we can all relate to. Sometimes when we talk about love, you know, it is mixed in with so many different other things and we think, oh, it's such a high standard, we can never meet this high standard. But being kind and being friendly is something I think we can all master to some degree. And then we learn to make it even bigger, even deeper. And that's when the unconditional part comes into it. The unconditionality means that we are kind and we are friendly even if it is difficult, even if we don't agree, even if, you know, it could be better. That's when acceptance comes into play and makes this quality very beautiful. So when we talk about metta or all the other Brahma Viharas, I always like to talk about them um, in two ways. I like to talk about what they mean. So one meaning could be that we develop, we grow, we cultivate the wish, and then also the action which grows out of this wish for the happiness and the welfare for ourselves and for other beings so that we have a little bit of an idea where we are heading, which direction we are heading in. So I always give a bit of a definition. Of course, there's many, many different um, definitions, but I hope that resonates and makes sense with you. And then we need something to kindle this feeling within our own, our own heart, like we kindle a fire. And what can be helpful for metta is if we are reflecting or if we are seeing the beautiful qualities, the beneficial qualities, rather than focusing on all the problems, than focusing all the things that are wrong. Of course, metta means in the end that we can embrace all those things that are difficult, but it's so much easier if we focus on what is good, what is beneficial, what, it is, what is nice already to kindle that feeling of metta so it can become strong and powerful. So one thing I've done to kind of understand uh, the Brahma Viharas for myself is I think about them as a journey. So the journey starts where we are, or the journey starts even in the opposite of what we're trying to develop. And then slowly, slowly we make our way on that journey closer and closer to what metta actually is. But of course we are at different stages at different times in our day. But I think it's quite a nice way to look at it as a journey. And you might have also heard that people sometimes talk about, you know, near enemies and far enemies and, and through that journey we can actually go through all these um, qualities. So we go through the problems and the pitfalls and we go through what it actually means. So we move slowly from having a mind which has ill will, which has irritation, which has resistance, and we move towards goodwill. We have a mind which might still be attached, might want to control the outcome of a situation, 
And from that mindset, from that attitude, we move towards encouragement and towards friendship. So how does that look like? So when we start our journey, we start it right from the opposite. So goodwill, the opposite is ill will. And I always try to find a little catchphrase for us to understand what we're talking about. So the ill will might mean here, you don't belong or you don't deserve to be loved. And that's always towards ourselves or towards another person. So if we don't find metta in our hearts, then it might manifest in this way. So um, yeah, please don't worry about all the words and things. If you wish to have the slides later down the track, we can make a PDF and share it with people so they're not too busy writing down things. And uh, please, Bandichunda, feel free to jump in anytime. <laughs> Because we can just shorten the meditation a little bit, the first one. Because we, we, we only have one day, yeah? Mm. Normally this course is, is about two, two or three days. So <laughs> it's actually condensed to, um, to one day. <laughs> I hope it's not too much information. Right. So once we move a little bit away from the opposite, we might still be dealing with shame, blame or guilt. We might be feeling you are or I am not enough of this or of that, so I put some dot dot dots there so you can fill them out for yourselves, you know, I'm not successful enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not a good parent, I'm not a good monk, I'm not a good whatever, or I'm too much, I'm too exuberant, or I'm too, I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> so we have shame, blame or guilt, which is basically the opposite of accepting what is happening in the present moment and then moving on from there then we have intimidation and threats so we are still dealing with the kind of opposite things here so we might want to control people we might want to tell them i will love you i will respect you i will like you if you do this or um, if you say what i want or if you do what i want so it's basically intimidation and threats and not um, being kind to another person so control and expectation goes in there as well. So pretty much covered that. And it always has to do with the self-interest, what we actually want, rather than understanding what the other person maybe wants or what we deeply want in our heart to have a peaceful, kind heart. Then we move towards tolerance. Tolerance is one of those words where we go like, OK, I'll bear with this. <laughs> But there very often is a little bit of this, but <laughs> I'm still right. I'm still in control here. So, okay, I'm going to be tolerant, you know, <laughs> but you still have to do what I want. <laughs> so we haven't quite reached this unconditional stage there. We still want to be right and in control. Then we get to the stage where we feel like, oh, wow, we have actually received so much people have been kind towards us. So we don't just tolerate, we feel inclined to res to reciprocate, reci well, whatever the word is, <laughs> to give back basically, to have the word of reciprocity. You give, I give, I give, you give. It's a bit of a business relationship, but it's still better <laughs> than what we had before. And then we move into being nice, which is great, but we want to make sure that the niceness is actually genuine. Sometimes the niceness can be quite cold or quite distance, distant. So people are using kind words, but they don't quite mean it or they have this distance. So I don't want to get too involved with the other person or with, within, with those qualities which are within myself. Then once we move into attachment, which is the close enemy, as we call it, or they call it in the commentaries, we uh, deal with fear, uh, loss and isolation. So we are actually afraid that we can lose something that we love, that we treasure. So we grasp it, we hold on to it in a way which is not so healthy. So control is one way of holding on and then fear is another way of holding on and trying to influence and change. 
And then we have attachment and grasping. So even though we might be together with someone, um, which we really love to some degree genuinely, there is still this kind of idea of we are inseparable. If I'm without that person, um, yeah, I'm kind of lost. And we get too attached. We don't have enough independence to realize that when we are together with a other person and we get inspired by their goodness, something red in, resonates within our, our own, own hearts and we can develop the same quality within our own hearts and we become more independent that way. So that's kind of like the journey that we take to um, uh, Metta. I'll just put all the words there again. So on the slides, they will also be there. Anything you wish to add, Panditchanda, right now? All good? Yes. All good? Okay. <laughs> so what are actually expressions of Metta? How could we describe Metta kindness? So it's a respect. I respect you and I respect your strength. I respect your choices, but I also re respect your limitations. As I said, we all have our weaknesses and we all have our strengths. So we unconditionally accept the whole package, not just one part. When metta is really developed, we accept, we take a person as they are, we take ourselves as we are. And that's what we will practice in meditation, hopefully. So we accept wherever our body is at, wherever our mind is at, and we practice from there, and we don't get all caught up in expectations, but that will come later. Um, unconditional kindness, Ajahn Brahm's favorite um, story, or one of the stories he tells a lot, is the story with his father, where his father said, the door of my heart is open to you, even if, no matter what. That was basically the expression of his father telling him when he was in his teens, you know, son, I love you unconditionally. The door of my home is always open to you, he actually said. But Ajahn Brahm realized it meant the door of my heart is always open to you, no matter what you do in life. Um, forgiveness is part of metta as well. So we are willing to start afresh. We are willing to forgive. We are willing not to carry um, things from the past and be kind and develop the friendships we have. So friendships, we are in this together. You can count on me. That could be some of those phrases that are connected with Metta. And that will give freedom and encouragement. So if we are together with someone, we make sure that we allow them to do their thing in their way and uh, tell them that we trust them and support them in whatever, whatever they are doing. It's a much, much more healthy way of going about things than trying to tell them what to do, try to control them into doing things. So that's a few descriptions about Metta and the journey to Metta. And then hopefully we are as happy as those two little animals there, I guess, a bunny and a teddy bear. <laughs> Pandit Chunda often says, meditation is like feeling like a child inside again, isn't it? Yes. So one thing I find, being kind to other people, um, generally, um, most people are kind to everyone. Um, we have one guest that came to the monastery, and um, he's a kind person, he's nice to everyone at the monastery, especially the monks and one another. But, while he stayed in the monastery for a few days, a uh, um, few days later he came and asked me uh, that he find that he was getting a bit sad uh, inside here. Uh, and he asked, why is he sad? And I say, it's okay, sometimes things do come out in our heart and we have to learn to be kind to oneself because matter goes both ways. Be kind to other people are very important. When we are by ourselves, when we have too much expectation, when things are not doing uh, well, and if the meditation is not doing well too, sometimes you have to send loving kindness to oneself. Because loving kindness is a very powerful um, emotion. It's kindness, it's peace, and also it's loving, uh, letting go. 
So when you develop loving kindness, sir, it's very important to develop loving kindness into one's self and heart. Sir. So that's why matter is something yeah, that comes within our heart. Sir. So when we bring it out, then we develop in the heart. Then when we are by, by ourselves, we are happier. Yeah. So the inner child sir, sometimes is, is at hurt, and um, you have to, we have to learn to develop and send matter sir, to oneself. Sir. That's very important. Okay, so I have one more poem that I would like to share with you before we go into the first um, guided practice together. So I think we're actually not doing too badly with time, after all. <laughs> so let's do that. Love means letting go. Letting go of the expectations to gain something. Letting go of the idea of losing something when we give. Letting go of the compulsion to play a role to please others. Letting go of views how others should be. Letting go of the desire to take possession of things and people. Letting go of the state of being dependent. Letting go in order to be free, to really love others. And <laughs> the author of this poem is this person over here. <laughs> so when I ordained as a monk in 2003 in India, uh, temporarily under most venerable Acharya Buddha Rakita. This is a poem that came to me and that I wrote down at that time. And so let's see if we can practice a meditation together in the spirit of that poem. Okay, so please feel free to uh, grab a chair if there is still a chair. <laughs> or one of the benches at the back or wiggle around and just make sure that you are in a comfortable position for the meditation that we will do together. We can check, I don't know. Is, is everyone comfortable um, temperature-wise? It's all good? Yes? Okay, no complaints. <laughs> so it will be a guided meditation, so um, you can just come along uh, with the guidance. And we'll see how we go, but probably maybe about half an hour or so to start off this day, and then the meditations we'll be doing afterwards um, might be a little bit longer if that is something you would like to do. Okay, finding a comfortable position and one good way uh, to do that is to just let your eyes gently close and then allow your senses, allow your mind, allow your awareness instead of going out into the world to come back to this body of yours. So we try to see if we can not have the mind pulled out into the world but fall back onto ourselves. That's how I often like to envision it. And for meditation and for the whole program today, let's see if we can be more receptive rather than being responsive 
What does that mean? It means that we develop the beautiful qualities of listening, of feeling, and of simply knowing. They're all receptive qualities. Just being there and receiving information. And then hopefully we can grow skillful responses of love, of care, of joy, and of peace throughout this day. So let's take a few deep breaths together. Breathing in through the nose and breathing out through the mouth. Maybe you want to let your out breath be a bit longer than your in breath. Breathing in through your nose and breathing out through your mouth. And maybe one more time, breathing in through your nose. Uh, sorry, breathing in through your nose, yes. And breathing out through your mouth. Letting your body know now is the time to relax and be at peace. And you can allow your breath to return to a natural, normal pace. And then Ajahn Brahm usually likes to start with a body scan. See if you can imagine that your body is like a puppet. And usually we push and pull the strings to tell it what to do. But let's see if this time we can actually let go of those strings. So there is one string though which is attached to the top of your head or kind of like a rod which holds the puppet. So you can feel that string or that rod attached to the top of your head at the crown. And then you can allow the whole body to hang on that. Making sure that all the other strings are nice and loose. Making sure that the strings attached to your shoulders, to your elbows, to your wrist, to your hands, that they are completely let go of, that they are completely loose. so that your shoulders and your arms can just drop supported by your legs or supported by each other in your lap maybe check if the position of your hands and arms is, is good if not, please feel free to move them in a more comfortable position. But then once you've done that, you can let go. You can let them rest.
And then the same thing with your legs. Make sure your bottom is on the chair or on the mat in the right way. If not, feel free to wiggle it around a little bit. Bring your legs into a comfortable position. Make sure your feet are not squashed. Or when you're sitting on a chair, you can just let them rest on the ground. And as they are supported, there is no pulling or pushing required. All those strings that need to be pulled in life can now be loosened, can now be let go of. So that our hips, our knees, our ankles, our feet can rest, can relax, can be at ease. What we're doing here is sending the metta, we're kind we trust them, we let them do their thing without interfering. And then we can allow the spine to be supported by the ground or the chair to be held up by the string or the rod from the top. So that means we don't have to do anything. We can loosen all the strings, so to speak. We can let go of the pushing and the pulling. And we can allow this area to deeply rest and relax. Allowing the belly to be soft. Allowing the lower back to be relaxed. Allowing all the organs to take a break, the digestive system, the heart, the lungs. We don't interfere. And then they run smoothly all by themselves. And we can allow the chest to be open and relaxed. To breathe naturally. Then we can relax our necks. all around and the spine inside and make sure that the head is just balancing on top supported by the spine hanging on the string on the rod of the puppet perfect balance so we can let it go so we don't have to worry about it
And as we're relaxing our body, we're also relaxing our mind at the same time. All the muscles, especially in our face, are connected to our emotions in quite a direct way. So let's make sure no strings are pulled on our face. Let our forehead be relaxed, smooth, our eyebrows and our eyelids and the eyes in the sockets be relaxed and at ease. Same with our nose. and the mouth, and the cheeks, and the chin. Not holding, not pushing, not pulling. Just allowing them to be, allowing them to rest. Allowing your jaw to be relaxed and at ease. And now we can hopefully feel relaxation, ease, and some joy from having a relaxed body. So hopefully the puppet has now all strings loose and relaxed. But if not, no problem. Find wherever the body is still a bit tense. And then loosen that string through being kind. Through accepting what is there. Through embracing what is there. With unconditional kindness. allowing it to relax. And then you can allow your body to just fade into the background. Trusting that it will take care of itself. Trusting that it is safe. And you can turn inwards. And that's where our thoughts live where our emotions are moving about. We want to make sure that we also give our brain, we also give our mind a break.
same principle here. Whatever thoughts or emotions may arise, we just listen, we just feel, we just know. without getting involved, without changing things, without pushing or pulling. And then we will notice that our thoughts and our emotions can relax as well, which means they tend to slow down. They tend to settle. They tend to fade into the background. Whatever might arise, whatever expectation, whatever tension, we just watch. And we let kindness unconditional acceptance arise in our hearts and meet it. And that will soften everything. That will relax everything. And that will allow the mind to find some peace and some rest. And if you happen to be aware of your breathing, you can use the breath to calm things down even further. By breathing in peace and by breathing out, letting go. naturally and smoothly, just receiving the breath and allowing it to flow out again.
without creating friction. Breathing in peace and then breathing out like go. Breathing in peace Breathing out, letting go And as we approach the end of this short meditation, please be patient and don't rush into meditation or out of meditation. Take stock. Feel what has happened to your mind. Feel what has changed in your body. How much peace, how much relaxation and ease were you able to grow? And why? Or if some tension has increased or some thinking has increased, no problem. But ask yourself, why? What was the reason? That way you can learn what creates peace and calmness and what creates tension and turmoil so you can choose to direct your mind in the right direction developing what you intend to develop so you can allow the mind to move again the thinking to start up again you can get in touch with your body feel the sensations in your body and then you can allow the gong the singing bowl to gently take you out of meditation and back into this room Please feel free to open your eyes. Maybe I'll just add a few words before we have a 
a little break for the people who wish to go to the toilet or have a sip of water or something. I notice that the culture we live in, that the people around us and that we ourselves put a lot of pressure onto ourselves, have a lot of expectations and they're standing in the way of meditation, of relaxation and peace. So I want to make sure that the environment we create here today is an environment that doesn't support or encourage that. So we're all just practitioners practicing together on the path. So we want to make sure that we encourage and support each other. So we don't feel that there is any pressure from people around us, that there isn't any pressure that we internally create. So that's why I wanted to start off with this meditation of really taking off that pressure from the body when you imagine it as a puppet. But the same thing is happening on a mental level. We are trying to influence ourselves. We are trying to influence other people with control and force rather than with unconditional acceptance and encouragement. That's a very kind of soft energy if it's any kind of energy in a forceful sense at all. Um, but did you know you wish to say a few words? Or? If, um, if you if you're not used to sitting a uh, long period of, of time, if any pain arises on your feet, it's okay to just gently move it around, adjust it, make it comfortable, then you go back to your breath. This meditation is not enduring and sitting full pain because life is hard enough. Eh? So when you come to a, a, a retreat, eh? try and relax this body as much as possible. Because we don't want to um, um, make meditation another work, another chore eh? to get through. Eh? Because meditation... Oops, <laughs> is it gone? Oh, goodness. <laughs> Did the battery run out or something? <laughs> Hang on, here we go. How I see meditation is we, we work so hard during the day and when we're tired, we go back home, we take a t shower to refresh our body and to clean this body yeah? so we, we feel nice, nice and fresh and then we can uh, basically sleep, rest, do what we need to do during the day. Yeah? But with meditation, I'm calming the body and mind. Yeah? It's basically giving a mental shower la, to this body and mind. So we meditate. La. Meditation is to calm the mind and to relax the body. Because if you relax the body, yeah, then you ha have a healthy body. And if you calm your mind la, and purify the mind, la, then you have a happy, mindful, mental awareness. One thing that we teach in Perth, um, the monks are invited to teach at the hospital uh, in Armadale meditation class. Uh, and one thing the doctors had noticed that people that come for the meditation class, uh, they tend to uh, recover more quickly. And sometimes if they have uh, terminal cancer, they tend to live longer than um, people that don't come for the class. Uh, so yeah, so learning to be kind to this body, to be kind to the mind. It gives the mind ability yeah, to really regenerate yeah, and to uh, recover this body that is tired, that is um, sick, or is getting older. Because when I was a lay person, I used to work so hard. I work two shifts, I work in the morning, I work at night, then 
and I came back home, my mom was so active, thinking about work, family responsibility, myself, my friends, to the point where I got a bit of anxiety arising, that's where my hand was shaking, my hearing was um, a bit of ringing, then uh, my eyesight was going a bit blur, then I feel like a headache in my head. So when I heard about meditation and loving kindness, uh, I realized, okay, I need to be kind to myself. Uh, so more I practice loving kindness to myself, then when I sit down and meditate, yeah, one thing I noticed, my shaking went, my hearing improved, my eyesight, um, the blurriness went away, but my headache basically went. It felt like someone was pressing my head all the time, uh, just the, um, being so busy uh, as a lay person. Uh. So when I said, calming the, the mind body, uh, the headache went away. Uh. And one thing I noticed, um, I wasn't getting that sick quite often anymore. Uh. Maybe I might get sick once a year or twice a year. But usually I used to get sick maybe every two weeks, uh, sorry, every two months. Yeah, so I got really interested in meditation. Uh. So that's why I really wanted to ordain. Uh. And while I ordain, I find that, wow, okay, I have more time to practice meditation. Uh. And um, yeah, these days, since I ordained to now, uh, I only been to the doctor once. And it was just recommended by some monastic and friends uh, to um, check out one of my skin con condition here. Uh, it was getting a bit darker because I was supporting one of the, one of the monastery in Melbourne, working morning, afternoon and evening. Uh, so yeah, so I was under a lot of pressure uh, to get that place going. Uh, and when I went back uh, to the main monastery, um, yeah, I, my Melbourne, I did check my, my skin here. When I went back to the main monastery uh, in Bodhiyana, uh, after one or two weeks, my headache went away and my, my dark spot here disappeared. Uh, so I realized a lot of tension is hold up in this body. Uh, so when you come to this monastery, please, this um, center, beautiful center, uh, it's nice and quiet. Uh, please learn to relax this body as much as possible. Uh, so it gives the, the maximum um, condition uh, to recover. Uh, this meditation is very powerful. We have some supporters that have been meditating uh, um, for a few years and they're not meant to be alive. But some of them have like um, four stage cancer and the doctors say they don't have much time and some actually live longer like in so few months they end up living few years and some rare cases uh, um, yeah the cancer basically disappear and they're still alive or they live with the cancer uh, and uh, it's not a problem yep so everything is um, all the tension is generated uh, within the body and mind and I was listening to a BBC news uh, recently uh, and I heard that the cancer rate uh, for young people uh, under 50 uh, has gone up 80%. Uh. I go, wow. And these are in the Western world. So I guess people are under a lot of pressure uh, and stress uh, to perform uh, and do their duty. Uh. So that's why meditation has been very popular in the West. Uh. Yep. So um, for some that have been to the retreat center, you know it's very hard to get in. Uh. We run about maybe 12 <laughs> retreats a year, and sometimes when the retreat opens, uh, within one or two minutes, uh, it's fully booked. So it's been very popular. Okay, thank you. All right. Oops. Now we really switch off. <laughs> you have to go back, eh? <laughs> okay, let's take a break now and come back in five or ten minutes. And then we'll have another session. We also make sure we explain a little bit about walking meditation. So for the next session, you can do some walking if that is more conducive. Okay, see you soon.